Chapter 9 When Lily woke on the morning after her translation to the Emporium Hotel, her first feeling was one of pure physical satisfaction. The force of contrast gave an added keenness to the luxury of lying once more in a soft pillowed bed and looking across a spacious sunlit room at a breakfast table set invitingly near the fire. Analysis and introspection might come later, but for the moment she was not even troubled by the excesses of the upholstery or the restless convolutions of the furniture. The sense of being once more lapped and folded in ease, as in some dense, mild, medium, impenetrable to discomfort, effectually stilled the faintest note of criticism. When the afternoon before she had presented herself to the lady to whom Carrie Fisher had directed her, she had been conscious of entering a new world. Carrie's vague present presentment of Miss, Mrs. Norma Hatch, whose reversion to her Christian name, was explained as the result of her latest divorce, left her under the implication of coming from the West, with not unusual extenuation of having brought a great deal of money with her. She was, in short, rich, helpless, unplaced, the very subject for Lily's hand. Mrs. Fisher had not specified the line her friend was to take. She owned herself unacquainted with Mrs. Hatch, whom she knew about through Melville Stancy, a lawyer in his leisure moments, and the Falstaff of a certain section of the fe of festive club life. Socially, Mr. Stancy might have been said to form a connecting link between the Gormer world and the more dimly lit region on which Miss Bart fa now found herself entering. It was, however, only figuratively that the illustration of Mrs. Hatch's world could be described as dim. In actual fact, Lily found her seated in a blaze of electric light, impartially projected from various ornamental extractances excrescen on a vast concavity of pink damask and gilding, from which she rose like Venus from her shell. The, anal the, analogy, the, analogy, the analogy was justified by the appearance of the lady, whose large-eyed prettiness had the fixity of something impaled and shone under glass. This did not preclude the immediate discovery that she was some years younger than her visitor, and that under her showiness, her ease, the aggression of her dress and voice, there persisted that ineradicable innocence which, in ladies of her nationality, so curiously coexists with startlingly extreme, startling, startling extremes of experience. The environment in which Lily found herself was as strange to her as its inhabitants. She was unacquainted with the world of the fashionable New York hotel, a world overheated, overupholstered, and overfitted with mechanical appliances for the gratification of fantastic requirements, while the comforts of civilized life were as unattainable as in a desert. Through this atmosphere of torrid splendor moved wan beings of rich, as richly upholstered as the furniture, beings without de definite purpose pursuits or permanent relations, who drifted on a languid tide of curiosity from restaurant to concert hall, from palm garden to music room, from art exhibit to dressmaker's opening. High-stepping horses or elaborately equipped motors waited to carry these ladies into vague metropolitan distances, whence they returned, still more wan from the weight of their sables, to be sucked back into the stifling inertia of the hotel routine. Somewhere behind them, in the background of their lives, there was doubtless a real past, peopled by real human activities. They themselves were probably the product of strong ambitions, persistent energies, diversified contacts with the wholesome roughness of life. Yet they had no more real existence than the poet's shades in limbo. Lily had not been long in this pallid world without discovering that Mrs. Hatch was its most substantial figure. That lady, though still floating in the void, showed faint symptoms of developing an outline, and in this endeavor she was actively seconded by Mr. Melville Stancy. It was Mr. Stancy, a man of large resounding presence, suggestive of convivial occasions and of a chivalry finding expression in first-night boxes and thousand-dollar bon bonneries, who had transplanted Mrs. Hatch from the scene of her first development to the higher stage of hotel life in the metropolis. 
It was he who had selected the horse, horses with which she was taken, which with with which she had taken the blue ribbon at the show, had introduced her to the photographer whose portraits of her formed the reoccurring ornaments of Sunday supplements, and had gotten together the group which con constituted her social world. It was a small group still, with heterogeneous figures suspended in large, unpeopled places. But Lily did not take long to learn that its regulation was no longer in Mr. Stancy's hands. As often happens, the pupil had outstripped the teacher, and Mrs. Hatch was already aware of heights of elegance as well as depths of luxury beyond the world of the Emporium. This discovery at once produced in her a craving for high, higher guidance, for the adroit feminine hand which should give the right turn to her correspondence, the right look to her hats, the right succession to the items of her menus. It was, in short, as the regulator of a germinating social life that Mrs. Bart, Miss Bart's guidance was required, her ostensible duties as secretary being restricted by the fact that Mrs. Hatch, as yet, knew hardly anyone to write to. The daily details of Mrs. Hatch's existence were as strange to Lily as its general tenor. The lady's habits were marked by an oriental indolence and disorder pecu peculiar, peculiarly trying to her companion. Miss Hatch and her friends seemed to float together outside the bounds of time and space. No definite hours were kept, no fixed obligations existed. Night and day flowed into one another in a blur of confused and retarded engagements, so that one had the impression of lunching at the tea hour, while supper was often merged in the noisy after theater supper, which prolonged Mrs. Hatch's vigil till daylight. Through this jumble of futile activities came and went a strange throng of hanger-ons. Manicures, beauty doctors, hairdressers, teachers of bridge, of French, of physical development, figures sometimes indistinguishable by their appearance or by Miss Hatch's relation to them, from the visitors constituting her recognized society. But strangest of all to Lily was the encounter, in this latter group, of several of her acquaintances. She had supposed, and not without relief, that she was passing, for the moment, completely out of her own circle. But she found that Mr. Stancy, one side whose sprawling existence overlapped the edge of Mrs. Fisher's world, had drawn several of its brightest ornaments into the circle of the Emporium. To find Ned Silverman, Silverton among the habitual frequenters of Miss Hatch's Mrs. Hatch's drawing room was one of Lily's first astonishments, but she soon discovered that he was not Mr. Stancy's most important recruit. It was on little Freddie Van Osburgh, the small, slim heir of the Van Osburgh millions, that the attention of Mrs. Hatch's group was centered. Freddie, barely out of college, had risen above the horizon since Lily's eclipse, and she now saw with surprise what an effluence he shed on the outer twilight of Mrs. Hatch's existence. This, then, was one of the things that young men went in for when released from the official social routine. This was the kind of previous engagement that so frequently caused them to disappoint the hopes of anxious hosts, hostesses. Lily had an odd sense of being behind the social tapestry, on the side where the threads were knotted and loose ends hung. For a moment she found a certain amusement in the show, and in her own share of it, the situation had an ease and unconventionality distinctly refreshing after her experience of the irony of conventions. But these flashes of amusement were but brief reactions from the long disgust of her days. Compared with the vast gilded void of Miss Hatch's existence, the life of Lily's former friends seemed packed with ordered activities. Even the most irresponsible pretty woman of her acquaintance had her inherited obligations, her conventional benevolences, her share in the working of the great civic machine, and all hung together in the solidarity of these traditional functions. The performance of specific duties would have simplified Mrs. Miss Bart's position, but the vague attendance on Mrs. Patch was not without its perplexities. It was not her employer who created these perplexities. Mrs. Hatch showed from the, ver from the first an almost touching desire for Lily's approval. Far from asserting the superiority of wealth, her beautiful eyes seemed to urge the plea of inexperience. She wanted to do what was nice, to be taught how to be lovely. The, difficult, the difficulty was to find any point of contact, contact between her ideals and Lily's. 
Mrs. Hatch swam in a haze of indeterminate enthusiasms, of aspirations culled from the stage, the newspapers, the fashion journals, and a gaudy world of, sp of sport, still more completely beyond her companion's ken. To separate from these confused conceptions, those most likely to advance the lady on her way, was Lily's obvious duty, but its performance was hampered by rapidly growing doubts. Lily was in fact becoming more and more aware of a certain ambiguity in her situation. It was not that she had, in the conventional sense, any doubt of Mrs. Hatch's irreproachableness. The lady's offense Fences were always against taste rather than conduct. Her divorce record seemed to be due, seemed due to geographic rather than ethical conditions, and her worst laxities were likely to proceed from a wandering and extravagant good nature. But if Lily did not mind her detaining her manicure for lunch, luncheon, or offering the beauty doctor a seat in Freddie Van Osburgh's box at the play, she was not equally at ease in regards to some of the less apparent lapses from convention. Ned Silverton's relation to Stancy seemed, for instance, closer and less clear than any natural affinities would warrant, and both appeared united in the effort to cultivate Freddy Van Osburgh's growing taste for Mrs. Hatch. There was as yet nothing definable in the situation, which might well resolve itself into a huge joke on the part of the other two. But Lily had a vague sense that the subject of their experiment was too young, too rich, and too credulous. Her embarrassment was increased by the fact that Freddie seemed to regard her as co cooperating with himself in the great social development of Mrs. Hatch, a view that suggested on his part a permanent interest in the lady's future. There were moments when Lily found an ironic amusement in this aspect of the case. The thought of launching such a missile as Mrs. Hatch at the perdiferous bosom of society was not without its charm. Miss Bart had not had even beguiled her leisure with visions of the fair Norma introduced for the first time to a family banquet at the Van Osburgs, but the thought of being personally connected with the transaction was less agreeable, and her momentary flashes of amusement were followed by increasing periods of doubt. The senses of these doubts was uppermost when, late one afternoon, she was surprised by a visit from Lawrence Selden. He found her alone in the wilderness of pink damask, for in Mrs. Hatch's world the tea hour was not dedicated to social rights, and the lady was in the hands of her masseuse. Selden's entrance was, had caused Lily an inward start of embarrassment, but his air of constraint had the effect of restoring her self-possession, and she took at once the tone of surprise and pleasure, wondering frankly that she should have traced her to so unlikely a place, and asked what inspired him to make the search. Selden met this with the with an unusual seriousness. She had never seen him so little master of the situation, so plainly at the mercy of any instruction she might put in his way. I wanted to see you, he said, and she could not resist observing in reply that he had kept his wishes under remarkable control. She had, in truth, felt his long absence as one of the chief, chief bitternesses of last months. His desertion had wounded sensibilities far below the surface of her pride.